Good morning and welcome to the virtual worship of Orland Park Christian Reformed Church. We're so glad that you are here. We thank God that you have joined us. We're sad that we must be apart, but we are thankful that God uses these means to keep us virtually connected, even while we can't be physically present. During the service, please do engage through posting comments or replying to people who have posted comments or liking and liking the comments of others. It's a good way to expand the reach of these videos, and also it's a great way for us to interact and engage in this time where we're all separated. Let me speak a word of opening blessing over you. Feel free where you are as a way to participate in this service to stand as you receive these words of blessing. What I'm about to do is quote scripture, is to quote a, a greeting from scripture to you. And so as you hear this, you can know that these are the very words of God. So stand up wherever you are and receive this opening greeting, this opening blessing from God. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, let's hear these words from the Holy Scriptures, and let's let them call our hearts into the worship of the triune God. Hebrews 12, 28 says, Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. And we're going to sing together, Here I Am to Worship.
is like a virus. Sin is like a virus. It has no existence on its own. It needs good to corrupt in order for it to, to exist, to live. It grows and spreads. It has symptoms, broken relationships, diminishment of the self, slavery to it, and ultimately death. James 1 tells us this. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15 from the English Standard Version tell us, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. That's bad news. And here's the even worse news. Every one of us has it. It's a global pandemic infecting every person alive and every person in history except for one. Every person in history except for Jesus. Now, let me tell you the good news. There is a cure for this disease. There is a cure for sin. And that cure is the blood of Jesus. Romans chapter 6 tells us that the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me call you and invite you to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one who has the cure for sin and death. Let me call you to trust in Jesus. And for every person that trusts in the Lord Jesus, let me give you some strong assurance. Christ Jesus has healed your disease of sin and death. Christ Jesus has forgiven all of your sins. You've been cured from the world's most deadly disease, the disease of death. You've been forgiven all of your sins. This disease is cured by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that means sin has no more hold over you, and death will not be able to keep you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You are forgiven. Praise Jesus. Let me give you an update now. Next week is Palm Sunday, and the following week is Easter. One of the things that I had hoped for is that we would be back together by then. When we first had to cancel all activities and suspend gathered physical corporate worship, and move entirely online. It was my hope that it would just be a few weeks that we might be back together by Palm Sunday or by Easter. But that is looking very unlikely. We're all going to need to plan to worship online for the time being. And that is very likely meaning through Easter Sunday and beyond. It means that for Palm Sunday, we're going to have to gather together separately And virtually, it means that for Good Friday, we're going to have to participate in that service virtually and in a distanced way. It means on Easter Sunday, we will sadly be separated unless the Lord works a miracle. On Good Friday, we often participate in the Lord's Supper together. Because of our present inability to worship together, we'll also not be able to participate in the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a physical reality, and it's a gathered corporate reality. Because of this, we don't do individual communion. When people who are shut into their homes are taken communion by the elders, it's an extension of the corporate gathered participation in the Lord's Supper. It's because of the fact that we have engaged together that the elders go out and provide it for those who aren't able to be physically present. But we're not a church or a tradition that does individual Lord's Supper. And because it is a physical reality, because it's one of the the physical things that the Lord Jesus has given to us to bless us for our good, it means that it's not something that we can engage in virtually. It means that we will have to engage in a fast from the Lord's Supper for the time being. And this is something that is very challenging. But as we fast, 
Know that God still feeds us. Know that God still feeds you. When Jesus was fasting in the wilderness, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He was still fed by God there. And during this fast, God will still feed you. He'll still feed us, even as we need to fast from the Lord's Supper. God will still feed us through prayer, through worship, digitally here, virtually, through worship at home with our families. God will still feed us by his word. God is still fast, faithful as we are fasting. But while we're fasting from the Lord's Supper, we should long all the more to be back together again. So with this knowledge, let's turn to God and pray. Would you pray with me? God, our Father, we thank you for all of your faithfulness. And Father, as we come before you and acknowledge that you are a good and faithful God, even in the midst of our time of separation, we acknowledge that it is difficult to be apart. We acknowledge that it is hard for us to not be gathered together corporately and physically. We acknowledge how challenging it is to be separated from each other and confined to our homes. Father, This week that we're approaching, remembering the triumphal entry of your son into Jerusalem, coming together for Good Friday where we remember the death of Jesus, worshiping together on Easter Sunday. Father, speaking personally, these are some of the most beneficial times of the church year. And we are going to miss being gathered together. I will miss the choir cantata on Palm Sunday. I will miss gathered presence in your house on Easter. Father, we miss participating together in the Lord's Supper. And we pray, Father, that you would enable us to return together again soon. We pray even if by some miracle you would bring an end to this virus so that we're able to gather together again next week or Good Friday or Easter Sunday. We pray that you might do that. We know that you are able to. We trust you in the midst of all of this. And so if you don't bring an end to this virus and you don't make it that we're able to be gathered together again, we pray that we would trust your faithfulness and your sustaining hand in the midst of all of this. Please, Father, continue to feed us through your word, through worship, and through prayer, even while we're fasting from being together and participating in the Lord's Supper. Father, help us to realize that you continue to be near and that you continue to be faithful. And as we are missing each other and missing corporate worship, we pray that you would increase our longing to be back together again, that you would increase our desire to be back together again. And we pray, Lord, that it would not be long before we are able to again open up the doors of the church and see the pews filled with people, commune together with you, participate together in the Lord's Supper. Lord, let this happen And let it happen soon, if it would be your will. Until then, Lord, we trust you. And we are grateful for your faithfulness. And we pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Our second song is the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And I'm going to invite you to sing along with. Thank you. 
I'm realizing right now at the beginning of the service, I invited you to stand. In case you're still standing, you can feel free to sit. <clears throat> I'm going to also invite you to take your Bible and to turn with me to Psalm 27, or click there with me, use your computer or your phone to navigate there with me to Psalm 27. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Malachi will wait until after Easter. This time needs a word. This week, someone from the congregation posted a meme that I, I really loved showing nine stages of Britney Spears' breakdown and asked the question of where you are in the course of this quarantine, with one being beautiful and made up Britney, and eight being the shaving of the head, and nine being the attacking of the paparazzi. And, and I don't know about you, but this week I felt at various times like I was a, about an eight, maybe just at the place before shaving off all of my hair. This is a time that is going to stretch us, that has already stretched us, and will continue to do that. This is a time where we need to understand and learn how it is that we can bear up under trouble, which means that Psalm 27 is a good word, a necessary word for us to hear right now to tell us how we can bear up in times of trouble. And it's by trusting the one who's our salvation. It's by trusting in God. And so let's look to Psalm 27 now. I'm going to read this for us, and we're going to hear what it is that God says in this beautiful psalm. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an enemy encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above all my enemies around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My face, your, my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not, O oh, God of my salvation, for my father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O oh Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for your word. We rejoice that you've given it to us. We thank you for how it speaks. We thank you for the fact that, that the Psalms that you've given to us, that the entirety of your Bible speaks to us at all times and all situations. We praise you for the unique and direct ways that your word can speak into specific situations like the one that we are presently facing. We pray, Lord, that you would take the words of this Psalm and that you would make them come alive 
We pray that I would say your words after you. We pray that you would enable me to preach a faithful message. We pray that if anything that I say doesn't come from you, that you'd make it fall to the ground and pass away and be forgotten. And we pray that everything that is from you would strengthen our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, would give us courage, would help us to be not afraid and to be patient. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. I've titled this sermon, Be Courageous and Wait. When you and I think of strength, we very likely think of a physical capacity to accomplish. A strong person gets things done. A strong person is never deterred. A strong person need not pause or go slowly or be patient because the strong accomplish things. The strong build things. They protect. They're self-sufficient. A strong man gets things done. A strong woman needs no man or anyone else. These are the things that we're told. A strong person doesn't need anybody else. Doesn't need anything else. Because of this, Certain strong people, I remember most particularly Jesse the Body Ventura when he was governor of Minnesota, said that Christianity is only for the weak, for those who need a crutch. People who are strong, people who are strong don't need God. But Psalm 27 tells us of the foolishness of these contemporary understandings of strength. A person strong in God rests in God. A strong member of the family of God recognizes God's ability to save, not one's own ability to save. A strong Christian recognizes the need for patience, the need to wait. And this right now, this time that we're in right now, is a time that calls for strength, and therefore, this is a time that calls for patience. This is a time that calls for ceasing our endless trust in the self. This is a time that calls for trusting God and God's salvation. And so this psalm has three different sections. It starts by telling us of confidence of, in God. It, it moves to a prayer for the presence of God, and it concludes with a command, a command for patience and courage. So let's work through the three sections of this psalm. First, confidence in God, confidence in God. The confidence of this psalm writer is not in himself, the confidence of David who writes the psalm is not in himself or in the strength of his forces or in the ability of his tactics, but his confidence is in the Lord. The Lord, we're told, is his light, his salvation, and his stronghold. In this present crisis, in this time in which we are engaged, you're going to see a great deal of the words, we'll get through this together, we'll make it together. And that is a great sentiment but if our hope is just making it through together, if our hope is just each other, if our hope is just one another, then there's not enough reason to have an enduring hope. However, if the Lord is your hope, you have great reason to hope. He is the light in a world of darkness and despair and uncertainty. The question is here, the Lord is my light and my salvation, and there are two questions. Whom shall I fear? And then the Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? These are two rhetorical questions that indicate I've got no one to be afraid of. I have no one to fear. Because I've got the strength and the power of the Lord, I don't need to be afraid. That's what the psalm writer is suggesting. I needn't fear anyone. I needn't be afraid of anyone because I have the Lord as my light and salvation and stronghold. Isn't this a great truth? You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. Not because of who you are. Not because you have small problems or issues. Not because that which stands against you isn't all that big of a deal. You don't need to be afraid when you trust in God because he is greater. 
God is greater than anything that you or I face or might ever face. God is greater. And so we need not be afraid, not because we are great, not because our problems are small, but because God is great and greater than anything that we might face. For David here, as he's writing Psalm 27, he's not facing small issues or problems. He's facing evildoers who are of a particularly gross variety. In verse 2, when evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh. These are people that want to eat his flesh. And then adversaries and foes are coming after him. But it gets worse from there because in verse 3, we're told, though an enemy encamp against me, my heart, an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. David's talking about an entire army being encamped against him. David's talking about a whole war rising up in his face, and yet he's still confident. Why? Not because David is great. Not because the army, the enemy, the war that he's about to face is small, but because God is greater than all of it. This is where your hope and assurance can lie. Not in your power, not in your potency, not in your ability or the weakness of your enemy, but in the greatness of God. Because God is light. And more than that, God is salvation. You need not fear because God is a God who saves. God saves from adversaries, from evildoers, from illness, from deadly pestilence, from sin, from death. From all of these, God saves. This is why you and I need to trust Jesus. Because he's proved that he is greater than any enemy. How did he prove that? Well, as, as Jesus entered Jerusalem, we're going to be talking about this next week, the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. As Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he knew what he was doing. He knew that he was going to the cross. He knew that he was entering into the city and, and he knew that all the forces of darkness in this dark world and that the devil himself was concentrating their energy on Jerusalem at that time and on the Lord Jesus Christ, seeking to stop him from his mission. Jesus went into Jerusalem to take his stand against all the armies of evil and darkness in this dark world. And the forces of darkness, the dark powers used what they thought was their best weapon against the Lord Jesus. They used death. And Jesus was put to death. And as he was nailed to the cross and as he hung there and died, he took his stand against all the forces of darkness in this dark world and even their most powerful attack could not defeat Jesus. In fact, it was by his death that he defeated sin and death and the devil, Jesus, died and rose victorious. And so you can trust that Jesus is stronger than anything that you might face. And if you belong to him, if he is your light and your salvation, your stronghold, you can say, it doesn't matter how strong my enemy is, Jesus is stronger. Jesus is greater. And in our current context, we'll get through this together. But not because we are great. Not because the virus has been less deadly here than in China or Italy. We won't get through this because Americans are uniquely resilient or some other such thing. We will get through this as the church because God is stronger. God is stronger than the virus. Now, let me make what should be an obvious point here. God is our light. God is our salvation. God is our stronghold. God offers us protection, real physical protection. But this protection of God and this reality that God is a light and a stronghold should not compel you to be foolish. Knowing that God is protecting and preserving you is not licensed to be unwise. It's not licensed to be dumb. Maybe you saw the viral, and I use that word, uh, uh, I guess, with, with great reason. Maybe you saw the viral TikTok video this past week of the young guy in New York City who was 
and this is gross, licking a toilet seat, showing that he was kind of, I don't know, resilient or is foolish. Well, unsurprisingly, he has the virus now. So let me make the obvious point. Knowing that God protects you is not licensed to be dumb. God's protection is not a license for a lack of wisdom. That should be obvious. It's not a call to rush headlong into, um, into foolishness. God's protection is not licensed to disregard the call to shelter in place. God's protection is not a reason to avoid social distancing. No, God's in pr- protection instead should motivate us to seek his presence. And that's what verses four through six talk about. The protection of the Lord leads the psalm writer, leads David to yearn to be in the protection of the Lord in the Lord's house. Let me read verses four through six for us again. One thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above all my enemies around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Because God is light, salvation, and a stronghold, because David doesn't need to fear, his deepest desire is what our deepest desire should be, to be near God. David here longs to live in the temple. He wants to live in the place that is the symbol of God's presence. He wants to be near God. And it's interesting how the tabernacle itself is where this psalm writer wants to dwell. It's the place of safety. It's the place where God will bring protection in the day of trouble. God will keep him safe in his dwelling. And this might not be what you would expect. An army's encamped against you. War is breaking out. You might expect the psalm writer to say, you're going to protect me by by bringing an end to all of my enemies. You're going to protect me with your sword and shield. You're going to protect me by removing the problem or the issue. You'll protect me by removing the threat. That might be what you anticipate the psalm writer saying, but that's, that's not what's said. According to verse 5, the protection of God comes not from the removal of threat, but by being in the presence of God. And let me tell you another wonderful thing. You are in the presence of God. You are in the presence of God. Jesus is present with those who trust in him. Jesus is present by the spirit of God through all who belong to him. Sometimes we pray prayers that God would be present with us. I'm never going to forget a talk that I heard from one of my professors in college. This professor said that he would pray, please make, Lord, please make clear to me, please make explicit to me what is already true, that you are with me. Jesus promised his disciples and and through, by extension, promised us before he ascended into heaven. He promised, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is with you. Jesus is with you. And this is good. And this is why my professor would pray, please make clear to me what is already true, that you are with me. You're in the presence of God. We talked last week about how we should yearn to be together worshiping God and we should continue to yearn and long for that. But you don't need to be in church to be in the presence of God. If you can be, you must be. You must be with the gathered people of God if you can be. But you don't need to be with the worshiping community of God to be in the presence of God. 
You don't need to be in this building to be in the presence of God. God is with you now by the Holy Spirit of God. And this should be an incredible comfort to you. You are in God's protective hands. He will set you high on a rock. You need not be afraid. And this should lead you to praise, just like it led David to praise in Psalm 27. Verse 6 tells us, I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Being in the presence of God, recognizing that he is with you, should lead you to want to sing praises to his name. And then the psalm continues by by actually praying for God's presence. (coughs) The mood of the psalm changes very suddenly in verse 7. Hear, O God, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. I mean, the first six verses of this psalm are are all of confidence, right, about the Lord's saving work. And now all of a sudden there is this heartfelt pleading that the Lord would not turn away from David, that the God would not turn his back on him, that he would not hide his face from him, that he would not leave him, that he would not cause his presence to go away from him. This mood change, this mood change has led some commentators or, or biblical scholars to say, well, this might, this must just be a couple of different psalms that are crammed together in the same heading, but I think this makes perfect sense, right? It makes perfect sense that in the first six verses that the writer of the psalm would talk about his, his unwavering confidence in God's protection, and yet in verse 7, all of a sudden long for it and, and, and have all sorts of pleas that he offers to God for it. This is at least the shape of my own heart. I don't know about you, but this is the way that my own heart operates. There are so many times where I am facing trouble or distress, and, and, and I begin by trusting that God offers protection and, and resting in that. And then my mind might wander for a second and I immediately, I'm immediately back in the pit of anxiety, wondering where God is and I need to cry out and be like, where are you? Our emotions and our trust in God can very often be like a yo-yo. In one moment we're saying, I trust you, God, I believe in you, I'm committed to you, and in the next we forget about it. And Psalm 27 is so helpful in this sort of way because God's people, if God's people are quick forgetters. This is the case with Jesus' disciples. I mean, those who had just seen him do wonderful works and then doubt him the next moment. This was the case with Israel, who saw him do wondrous works and then doubted God the next moment. This is the case with us, that we might profess trust and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, forget it and cry out and say, well, where are you? Don't leave me. Please don't go. And so the psalmist moves to crying out to God, suddenly fearful that perhaps the Lord will hide his presence. And there's a fourfold repetition of a similar plea for God's presence, and that indicates a a heartfelt soul searching and a great deal of anxiety expressed in these words. But the soul searching and the anxiety and the plea for God's presence leads to an even deeper trust in God. Do you see it? The psalm writer here realizes that even if the most unlikely people in the world to leave him ever leave him, God will not leave him. Verse 10 says, For my father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take it in. Even if the most unlikely person in the world leaves you, God will never leave you. God will never leave leave you. God will take you in even if no one else will. Even if no one else in the world does, God will still receive you. The love of God transcends every human standard, and this should lead us to follow his ways. Like verse 11 says, teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path and give me not to the will of my adversaries. This is a time when not everything is fine where you might be crying out, wondering where God is, let me assure you today in line with the scriptures that he will always take you in and never leave you. The psalm ends with another profession of trust in God. And this is a beautiful end to the psalm, verse 13 and 14. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living 
Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. The psalm here, this is such a beautiful, triumphant note. I believe I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. God is good. God is good. And what David is saying is, I believe I'm going to see it. I believe that even now as I'm living, I'm going to see the fact that God is good. And let me tell you, God is always good. And our belief can be in line with Scripture that we will look upon the goodness of the Lord and we will see it. Even in the midst of these troubling and difficult and distressing circumstances, you might still see the goodness of the Lord. My hope and my guess is that even though this is a hard time that is straining and stretching all of us, through it, you can see the goodness of God. We can pray the same thing. I believe that I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord. I believe it. And then the psalm ends with this command. Wait for the Lord. It's a command to be patient. Wait for the Lord. And then be strong and let your heart take courage. A command to be brave. A command to be courageous. And then wait for the Lord. A command to be patient. You and I need to listen and respond to this command. Don't be afraid. Be patient. Be courageous. Be patient. Don't be afraid. And be patient. This is what the psalm exhorts us to at the end, to not be afraid and to be patient. Now let me conclude by just getting a little personal. If you've seen the prayer update this past week for Orland Park CRC, you saw that I had to take my wife to the emergency room this past Wednesday. She was experiencing shortness of breath, so we took her to the ER, and while she was in the ER, the doctors diagnosed her with COVID-19. And before I took her to the hospital, I was scared. It was a scary thing to see her just come down a flight of stairs and then be winded, so she had to sit to be in a place where it was hard for her to catch her breath. I was scared. And dropping her off at the hospital and not being able to come in and driving back along with my children and not knowing what would happen, I was scared. And as I think about the situation in which we're entangled, there's a lot that scares me. I'm scared when I see the numbers climb of people who are infected. I'm scared when I see the death numbers rise. This is a deadly pestilence. It's frightening to be faced with a novel virus, one that the world knows so little about, and one for which there is no present treatment. It's frightening to think about the economy, about the jobs that have already been lost, and the jobs that will be lost if this thing continues for a while. It's scary to think about how the world might be different when this thing comes to an end. How things might be different when we have to leave our homes. It's scary to be cut off from most social con contact and be confined to one's home. And if you're like me, you might be a bit frightened by all of it. Well, let me tell you what I needed to tell myself this week. God is more powerful. God is more powerful. Be not afraid. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. God is more powerful. Be courageous and wait. Wait for the Lord. Man, this is a tough one, isn't it? Everything in contemporary society until probably about two weeks ago. <coughs> Everything militated against such patience. And now suddenly you and I are going to need it. We are going to need to be people of patience. We are going to, need to, going to need to be people who are able to wait for the Lord. We need it if the kids are in the home and there's no place to send them. Like in normal life. We need it if we're stuck at home without our usual outlets. We need it 
If we're getting on the nerves of our spouse because we're around them more than we have been, we need patience. We need patience if we're alone and relegated to digital connection with others. We need patience. We need to wait on the Lord. You and I need to prepare for a marathon rather than a sprint. Like I mentioned already in this service, I was hoping that when we canceled all in-person activities two weeks ago, that this would be a very brief and limited time of separation. Now it's looking very unlikely that church will resume to normal in the very near term. This is a time that calls for patience. This is a time that calls for a fruit of the Spirit. This is a time that calls for waiting on the Lord. But we're not waiting for nothing. We're waiting on the Lord. And as we wait, we pray that the Lord might grow in us this fruit of the Spirit, this fruit of patience. And waiting, the waiting that we do isn't the stale waiting of waiting for a chronically late friend of ours. Oh, great. Ugh. Again. This is not the kind of waiting that we do. This is not the kind of waiting on the Lord that we do. It's the waiting of trust, knowing that God is active, that God is doing something, that God's timing is always right. The waiting that we engage in right now, the waiting on the Lord, is the waiting of regular prayer, the praying, Lord, Lord, show us what you are doing. Lord, help us to understand what is happening. Lord, help us to see and understand the times. God, help us to believe that we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Lord, heal. Lord, protect. Lord, show your purpose in all of this. This is the kind of waiting that a Christian engages in, an active, prayerful, hopeful, loving, faith-filled, waiting on the Lord whose timing is always right, whose ways are always good, who does what is good. Be strong. Take heart and wait on the Lord. Be courageous. Be not afraid. Courageous enough to wait. Courageous enough to wait, hopefully and expectantly. Courageous enough to wait in a prayer-filled way. Courageous enough to know that nothing, nothing, nothing will be able to ever overcome you or destroy you because your fortress, your light, and your salvation is God himself. Be patient. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you, O Lord, are our light and our salvation. And that because of that, we needn't fear anyone or anything. We praise you that you are the stronghold of our life, and therefore we need not be afraid of anyone or anything. We pray that you'd enable us to wait for you, Lord. Give us strength, give us courage, and give us patience. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I mentioned in the sermon the fact that I took my wife to the ER on Wednesday, and I just want to assure you she is back home now. She is resting and recovering slowly. I don't want to leave you hanging thinking that she might still be in the hospital. She's home. Recovery is slow, but we're trusting God. We're waiting for the Lord. We're seeking to be strong in the Lord. Now, as we conclude our time together, I want for you to hear this closing blessing that comes from God. And again, I'm going to invite you to stand and to know that I'm speaking the words of God right now from the Bible, and that as we receive this, we receive the very word of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. We have a closing song. And you can join in and sing by the sea of crystal. Thank you for joining. God bless you.